ask yourself, what power does a streamer on Twitch have in influencing whether or not they end up being recommended to other viewers? What can I do as RN Hawaii on Twitch to make sure that I get on this recommended set of streamers as often as possible? I'll be streaming now exclusively on YouTube Gaming. Tim the Tapman, who was a huge personality in Twitch's portfolio, is now leaving Twitch for YouTube Gaming. And I think this has been a long time coming, and we'll talk about why in this video. And I think there's four main reasons why this is happening. Availability of content, discoverability, analytics, and revenue. And we'll talk about all of those different topics. We'll also talk about some of the downsides so far of the YouTube experience for streamers and content creators, uh, because it is important to note that uh, it's not entirely over for Twitch. There are some things that they still are much better at, and uh, we'll dive into those as well. All right, so the first topic is availability of content. And I think this is just a really simple formula here. On YouTube, your content is available 24 seven. Whereas if you're just streaming on Twitch, you're really only available to your audience for the hours that you are live. Yes, Twitch has VODs and people can go back and they can watch that stuff. But I don't go to Twitch to watch not live content. If you're not live, I'm just going to find someone else who is and I'm going to go hang out with them. And the big motivator there is that I will have that interactive experience by watching somebody who's live. We can talk, I can say stuff in chat, they'll see it, they'll respond, maybe I'll donate and get an alert with my name on it. So it just doesn't make sense to think that somebody is gonna go on Twitch to watch old streams. And that's actually why a lot of streamers upload their VODs from a Twitch stream to YouTube 24 hours or later than uh, their last broadcast because there is uh, discoverability, which is another topic that we'll get into shortly, but that's besides the point. Really the key thing here is that people are just not going to find you or watch you on Twitch when you're not live. Whereas YouTube already basically is a model where people go in and expect to see not live content. So having live content on YouTube is now kind of a bonus to that experience. All right, so I'm gonna dive in with our first main subject here, and that's discoverability. This is something that Twitch has struggled with for a long time, and I'm not the only person who's been very critical of the issues that Twitch has with helping streamers get discovered. And I think the simplest way to demonstrate that is for us to just go pick a category on Twitch right now, and I'll pull one up. We're just gonna scroll and see what that page looks like for that category. So let's say you're interested in an IRL streamer so you go to twitch's directory for irl people that are live now something twitch recently added is uh some categorization within certain gaming categories like irl where you'll get recommended feeds and um, i'm pretty sure those are just kind of based on who you're already following and who their followers are also following and stuff like that uh, and that can help a little bit with discoverability but in irl they've also kind of further broken it down into sports, talk shows and podcasts, ASMR, art, science and technology, because in the past, the IRL or just chatting categories, those were kind of interchangeable terms at the time. They just included too many different things, right? So maybe you were doing uh, travel, uh, but you were being buried by people who were literally just looking into a camera and talking about you know what they had for breakfast. And so these sort of subcategories were meant to kind of help with discoverability. But I'll dive into probably what's the most problematic one right now, and this subcategorization really hasn't helped, and that's just chatting. So now by default, it used to rank these by the number of current viewers, with the most being the first that you see, and then the least being all the way down. Now what they've done is they've added a sort by feature where you can go recommended for you or viewers high to low. But this is relatively recent stuff and it makes you wonder just how good is their recommendation system if it hasn't been out very long. Whereas YouTube has been in the business of recommending relevant content to users for a very long time. In fact, most people call YouTube a search engine uh, because it's just built that way to help you find stuff that you want to find. Now, what's interesting here is that with recommended for you as what this is being sorted by, you get kind of a mix of viewership numbers. We've got 6.9,000, uh, 166, 
419, 76, 701. So they're not ranking within that recommended sort based on views, which I think is good. That helps. That bias of the bigger people being at the top doesn't play into your ability to find somebody new here. But I think there's a lot more to be discovered about how Twitch decides who to recommend to you and why. Now, as I scroll down here, I am seeing the occasional streamer who has 10 or less viewers. So they're not really putting too much bias on people with say, you know, 20 plus or something like that. But I think just the jury is still gonna be out for a while on whether or not Twitch has actually improved discoverability in general on their platform. This is a great new system and I appreciate that they're making those efforts and maybe that's because the community has been complaining so long, but they may just be too late to the game at this point and the narrative that they're not good at it might continue despite the fact that they seem to be making efforts to change it. When you have a bad reputation about something like that for such a long time, it's just really hard to shake that perception, even if you try to change it. In a competitive landscape like content and streaming, timing is everything. And I think Twitch may just be too late to uh, affect what is about to happen on YouTube. And here's a really big comparison that needs to be made about discoverability. Ask yourself, what power does a streamer on Twitch have in influencing whether or not they end up being recommended to other viewers? What can I do as R in Hawaii on Twitch to make sure that I get on this recommended set of streamers as often as possible? And right now, because of how new this is, the answer is basically nothing. So you're at the mercy of whatever Twitch has decided is the algorithm that makes these decisions about who goes where. Now as a comparison, I'll go on YouTube and I'll pick one of my most recent videos here and I'll go into it. Now in here, I have so much more influence over whether or not my videos or my content gets recommended or found when people search uh, for the kind of content that I create. And YouTube even has an entire like creator suite of videos and articles that explain all of the ways to optimize the things that you can do in your videos to help make sure that you score really well in the discoverability aspects. The way that you compose your title helps. Whether or not you use keywords uh, in the top part of your description, whether or not those keywords mirror the title of the video, Obviously, thumbnails are important for people to decide whether or not to click, so those need to be attractive, but you get to make them. Tags are a critical component of making sure that when people search for specific terms or phrases, that the algorithm knows that based on the tags you put on your video, that um, it's relevant. And there are lots of other things here that you can also indicate that just helps define your content in such a way that if people search for certain things, uh, you may find yourself higher up on the list. So that's basically my case for discoverability being vastly superior on YouTube. The fact is you have the tools in hand to influence how successful you are at making sure that your content is visible to the relevant audience. Whereas on Twitch, you really have no options. There's just nothing that you can do to really influence how you get found other than being live uh, 24 hours a day, I guess. I don't know, at least for now, there's just no control that you can exercise over your ability to be found. Now, after discoverability, I'm gonna say that a business-minded person is gonna consider analytics to be critical to their success in order to grow as a creator and also to make a living or earn revenue. You need to know everything you can possibly know about how your content is performing and who's watching it. And I'm gonna show you those differences between Twitch and YouTube right now when it comes to the amount of information that the platform gives you to enable you to succeed. So we're gonna start on my Twitch dash. I'm gonna to go to Creator Dashboard and then Insights. We can start with an individual stream. All right, so we'll do this one over here from July 14th where I did a chess coaching stream with Tectone, who's an awesome Genshin Impact streamer, you should check him out. 
Um, and so there's some information on this stream summary page. We've got the duration of the stream, average viewers, max viewers, right, your peak uh, while you were live, unique viewers, people that may have not seen your channel before, total live views, the number of new followers that you gained, um, new subscriptions, kind of graph versions of some of that same information. And then where did my views come from? Twitch, 268 views, other recommendations. 99, 37%. But what does other recommendations mean? Does that mean the page that we talked about where you're on one page, but it says other people you should check out are this person and that person? Other, I wish I kind of knew what other was. And the browse page. So that's people just scrolling. Channels, okay, so that's the number of people that came to your channel directly from someone else's channel. And then you get this down here. How did my go live notification perform? And that's people who leave notifications on and you go live and they get maybe an alert on their phone or something like that. They get an email and they know you're live and then they click. Engagements is how many people actually clicked and follower reach is how many of those people who did click were already followers. And it shows you how many were sent. Now let's go to channel analytics and that shows more data over a period of time rather than just a single stream. And we can choose that period of time by clicking and we can choose a start date and an end date going back as long as we want. Or we can just click a preset like last seven, last 30 or month to month. I'm gonna go back to the month of May in 2021. Looks like I did eight or nine streams and it shows average viewers, followers, subs, revenue and hours streamed. You can click these and change them to other kinds of measurements like that one I just checked to see how many clips were created. There's a revenue breakdown that shows how much money you made and in what ways did you make it, what channels have viewers in common with mine to give you a sense of how your community is meshing with others. But really what I think matters here is where did my views come from? And we see the same things that we saw in the stream summary page but obviously it's counting all of the things from the month of May. Let's click view details and see how much more we get. Views by location, which is good because it gives you a sense of what time zones you should be doing things. Views by platform is good so you can see what kind of viewing experience are the people who watch you most using. Are they mostly on mobile? And if that's the case, maybe you need to lay out things to be more mobile friendly, like not having tiny text on everything. All right, so pretty much that's what we get on Twitch. Now let's take a look at YouTube. With the same video that we already looked at, I'm gonna click analytics and we get some of the same initial metrics that we get measured on Twitch. How many views, how many hours of view time, how many new subscribers that piece of content gained you and how much revenue it has earned for you. What I really love is these graphs that show you this video and how it's performing, which is that blue line versus this gray section, which shows the typical performance of your videos as kind of an average. That way you can see compared to your average content, how is this one in particular performing? Is it doing much better than the average? Is it performing within the average? Is it worse? Being able to compare how you're doing now versus how you've done in the past is huge in terms of being able to improve your content over time. And the better your content gets, then the more views it gets, the more you grow, the more you grow, the more discoverable, and all of these things feed each other into helping you skyrocket. And then information is also expressed here, 2.1K more than usual. Now, if I click see more here, I bust into a lot of extra stuff. You can actually get super granular if you want, and you can compare how that video was doing versus the average, but at specific points in time. This is at the first 29 days, and I can go this way, and now I'm at the first 60 to see if there are other kinds of behavior that you can extrapolate from this information that you can use to your advantage. Let's say I click that and I go to subscribers instead. Well, now I can see the rate at which the video earned me more subscribers. How long did it take for this video to get me an extra 30 subscribers, for example? I'm showing all this basically to show that whatever way you wanna measure your performance, you pretty much can. You just go in there and you pull that up. And at different stages of your growth as a content creator, those things are going to change. First, you're going to care about this. Then you're going to start to care about that as your growth goes a certain way. First, you maybe you just need your thousand subs so you can monetize your channel. But then after that, average view time starts to be more important than subscribers. 
And so you want an interface that's robust enough for you to go in and mine that information for the patterns of behavior that you need to examine. In this reach tab, you get uh, information on impressions. And that's when your content is presented to somebody. And the click through rate is how often that somebody decided to go ahead and engage with your content. This is not something that you get in that Twitch dashboard. And this can become very important to understand this behavior as you grow as a content creator. Because you want to know if some things you're doing cause more people to click through than other things. So you get the number of actual total impressions and the click through rate. And you can see comparatively here what they say is typical on YouTube on average and how you compare to what's typical. You also get the same stuff that you get on Twitch in terms of how many people with notifications on got alerts that this content went live. And of course, all your traffic sources, YouTube, browsing, suggested videos, channel pages, external, right? How many people found you from outside of YouTube? I post a lot of my video announcements on Twitter and so it shows me how many of these external things came from Twitter specifically. Now this is another huge one when it comes to growing and that's how many times was your video suggested to somebody else after they'd already watched uh, another video or something like that. Twitch is not necessarily showing you how many times they put you on the recommended page of somebody else and how many times that they did that, that that person decided to engage. And maybe if you're just a casual streamer, well, that kind of granularity of understanding doesn't really matter to you. But the reason why I'm making this video is because you want to be a better business person and business people want every piece of information they can possibly get on how their product is performing. Because you want as much control as possible to modify your product to increase its performance. And how do you figure out how to modify that if you don't have sufficient information to even see what the baseline is? Now, I wanna show you one other thing that I think is really awesome that YouTube provides you in terms of information about how your stuff is performing. If we go back into the main studio dashboard and I just click analytics from there, right? Not on a specific video, but just in general. And I click the engagement tab. There's this area here that shows how many people are still watching after the first 30 seconds on your content. This is such an amazing way to look at how your stuff is performing because on YouTube, people have a short attention span and they wanna click a piece of content and if they don't have a sense that in the first 30 seconds that this is gonna be the video that contains the answers that they're looking for, then what do they do? They go away and they look for another different one. So increasing the percentage of people who stick around past the first 30 seconds is one uh, thing that you can really work on. And it's actionable because really what you're talking about is developing a great hook, right? Something that gets them invested in staying and watching more of the video. So you can figure out ways to improve that. You can do your homework and see, well, maybe I'll try this next time. I'll talk a little bit more about what the video contains before I actually get into it. Or I'll tease some bonus content that if they stick around to the end, they'll watch. If you're making the right improvements, then you should see this percentage go up and then you know you're on the right track. For example, in this list, one of my oldest videos here has 32% retention after 30 seconds, whereas one of my newest videos has more than 50%. So obviously, I can look at that and I can say to myself, hey, I'm actually improving a little bit here. And that's either in terms of the value of the content given in the video, or maybe it's just the hook was better in those videos. My introduction to the content made people want to stay and see more of it. But this kind of contextualizing that YouTube is helping you do with this data, just it makes it so much easier than having to look at just a bunch of raw numbers and then determine relationships on your own. YouTube is giving you this kind of presentation of the relationships between your content and the engagement that that content receives to just help you understand that YouTube thinks that this is a very important aspect that you have to work on if you want to grow. All right, so let's get into the topic that I think most people wanna know about the most, and that's revenue. What are the different ways that you can make money on Twitch versus on YouTube? 
All right, so we'll just go to a streamer's channel and uh, let's see the different ways that I can donate money. I like the streamer and I want them to feel supported. So let's take a look on Twitch and see how we can do that. Well, the first one is Twitch has a built-in currency system called Bits. And basically what that is, is I can give one bit, which is equivalent to one penny uh, to that streamer. Now, bits have to be purchased from Twitch and that comes with a bit of a premium. You pay an extra amount of money on top of the one-to-one -one conversion of how many bits you want and how much that's worth to the streamer. But the good news is that the streamer themselves receives the entire revenue from the amount of bits you give them. So Twitch takes a cut on the front half when you buy bits, but then when you give them to the streamer, they get the full amount of money. I would buy them by clicking uh, get bits and then it shows the pricing. So for a dollar worth of bits, it's gonna cost me a dollar 40 cents to then give the streamer a dollar. The other common way that people show monetary support for streamers that they like on Twitch is by subscribing. You can click subscribe and then you get presented with a number of tiers to subscribe. I can click go above and beyond if I wanted to subscribe for more uh, than just the lowest tier of subscription, which is $4.99. I can go with $9.99 and $24.99. These amounts are determined by Twitch, not by the streamer. So it's the same price for a tier one, two, or three subscription across all channels. This gets charged to your account once a month, and you can also click to try to save a percentage off by subscribing in blocks of time. So three months worth or six months worth all at once and you get 10 to 15% off. Now, an important thing to know about subscribes on Twitch is that revenue on those are also shared with Twitch. So in most cases, the revenue split is 50-50 or 51-49, just about. And uh, so Twitch receives about half of the money that you spent to buy the subscription. So if you spent $5, the streamer is getting like 249 or 250 of that and Twitch, aka Amazon, gets the rest. Some streamers are able to negotiate a larger percentage, like 70-30, where they keep 70%, and Twitch only receives 30%, but that's usually part of a one-on-one -on -one negotiation between that large streamer and Twitch itself. What do subscribers get? Well, they unlock emotes that the streamer has designed and uploaded for their channel so that there's a little bit of flair in chat that they can use to support that streamer and say, hey, I'm a subscriber and uh, I support the channel and I love everything that you're doing, keep it up. So aside from bits and subs, Twitch has also unlocked ad revenue for not just their top tier partners, but recently also affiliates, which were sort of the first tier up from non-monetized accounts. And Twitch usually controls when those ads get played. Uh, when a user joins your channel, they usually receive a short pre-roll ad and then they can see your content. But the streamer also has the ability to trigger ads at different durations uh, anytime within their stream by going to their dashboard and triggering an ad. And in that channel analytics view in the dash, you can go in and you can see how much money was made on ads. And that's basically it. You've got bits, subs, and some ads on Twitch. Now let's show all the different ways that you can earn revenue on YouTube. Now on YouTube, you can earn ad revenue on most of your content once you get your channel monetized, uh, but you can do so in a very granular way. So in this video in particular, I'll click the monetization tab. You can choose whether to even monetize certain content. You can turn it off completely. But with it on, you have a lot of options. You can choose which kinds of ads can or can't be used on that content. So overlay ads, which rest on top of the video, or sponsored cards, which also kind of rest on top. Skippable video ads, where you see a certain number of seconds on the ad as the user, and then you can just decide to skip it and get your content back. Or non-skippable ads, where you have to play the whole ad through before the content reappears. You can also have pre-roll and post-roll ads. Pre-roll very much like you would have on Twitch where there's a short ad before you even see the start of the content. And if your content is long enough, and right now the standard is eight minutes, you can actually insert mid-roll ads. So at different points within the video, you can trigger an ad. And YouTube will place those automatically for you, but you can also go in and manage that. Basically setting the actual points where you want those mid-roll ads to land. And 
for the really savvy content creator, that can be a whole strategy in itself. Maybe I say, hey, guess what? This is the point where I tell you the absolute most important thing about this video. And then you've inserted a ad right at that moment, kind of like a cliffhanger. Man, I, I have to sit through this ad because he was just about to say the key thing that I wanted to learn from this video. So another thing that YouTube has that's very similar to Twitch's subscriber system is members. And if a channel has that activated, you can click the join button and you'll have different tiers. For $5 a month, you can join and you will get this and this and that. You declare, uh, you get some emotes and maybe there are some other perks that the creator gets to determine what those are. Uh, and then you as the creator can actually create your own tiers deciding how many tiers to have, what dollar amounts those tiers should be set to, and what perks uh, should be offered. If I go into my channel and I go into monetization, we can set that up. I'll click see more for memberships, set up my memberships offer, and here you go. I can choose one level, three levels, four levels, and then edit each of those levels. I can say how much money that level should cost, and YouTube even gives you recommendations of what the most popular tiers are so far. Uh, across the platform. You can give it a name, customize badges that go next to their usernames, just like subscriber badges on Twitch, emotes that get unlocked for those members. You can even offer priority replying to comments from members to make sure that you reply to their comments before anyone else's. And it gives you the ability to filter by channel members, just to make it easier to do exactly that. You can also just add custom perks where you make up what that perk is and what that's going to be in a sort of Patreon style format. And that way you can fully design every little aspect of what somebody is going to get by becoming a member. Twitch doesn't really have a way to build in this kind of a customizable experience within their subscriber system. So any stated additional perks to subscribing on Twitch are basically just stated elsewhere by the streamer verbally or in their description or somewhere else. Whereas this is baked in. When somebody decides to choose what tier membership they're going to subscribe to, it's written out exactly what you as the content creator are promising to offer them in exchange. In this example, they include access to perks from the initial level, but then for the additional $5 a month, they'll receive members only video courses, access to content and assets, exclusive Discord channel access and roles. And this has been designed by the content creator to maximize the value for that member. For creators that decide to stream live to YouTube, there's also something called Super Chat, which is basically tipping while the stream is live. This is actually not something that Twitch has currently. If you wanted to just donate a dollar amount directly to the streamer on Twitch, you actually have to go through Streamlabs or another service that's actually third party and not built in on Twitch. Whereas on YouTube, you can do a super chat from inside YouTube. You click super chat, you determine the amount of money that you wanna give, you can type a message, and then when you send it, your comment would actually be highlighted in the chat itself. For example, this one right here for $15. So it stands out, draws the attention of the content creator, and uh, they get to thank you for making that contribution. And that all happens right on the platform. They don't have to go to an external website in order to send you something. You can also send super stickers, which is just sending a cute design that costs a little bit of money and that money goes to the creator. Now, in my opinion, the biggest thing that YouTube is about to introduce for people to make money on their content is applause. This is basically a tipping button directly on the video itself where you can decide to thank that content creator for making that content for you. It's currently being tested to a limited number of users, but YouTube has said that this is coming out to all monetized accounts in the near future. And as of the date that I'm creating this video, this has been being tested now for, I think about a year. You get this little thanks button that you can enable on your channel and I can click that and I can send a thank you for a dollar amount and then that's gonna pin a comment at the top of the comment section, highlighted in a color showing that I appreciated them for making that video. Again, all built in. So you don't have to go elsewhere to do this. And I think that's huge because people 
who consume things on the internet want those platforms to be a one-stop shop for everything that they want to do, every way that they want to engage. For me, it gives me a sense of security that I'm not being taken outside of the platform to do something on a service that I don't really know much about when if it's built in, the creator is right there and I know that it's a trustworthy process. This applause feature or thanks feature is I think going to be revolutionary because typically if you are not live, then that kind of a direct donation and appreciation system just doesn't exist. You need to be on live. And so the pressure is huge for streamers to be live as many hours through the day as possible just to maximize the opportunity time for people to give them money. Now, with this system, however, your content is available to viewers 24 hours a day. And maybe it only takes you an hour or two to make a really great video that is available to anyone in any country at any time. And if they feel appreciative in that moment for what you gave them, they can engage with sending you some cash right then and there. So it's just another way outside of ad revenue for you to be making money while you're asleep. The content is working for you 24 hours a day with no pressure to have to come up with an exhausting streaming schedule and stick to it. If you stream live for two hours on Twitch, and then once you go offline, I mean, the engagement is kind of over at that point. People want to have a relationship with you. They don't want to just send money. They want to show appreciation. Whereas if you spent that same two hours making a great piece of content that you can put on YouTube, then that's working for you 24 seven. That's two hours of work that lives on the platform for as long as you leave it up there. And it keeps making money for you. Whereas the only way to keep making money on Twitch is to keep streaming. This also feeds back to a point about discoverability. And that is if you're less discoverable, then that means the two hours that you're live is a very narrow window to be found by new people. Whereas your content on YouTube is working for you 24 seven, it's discoverable 24 seven. Okay, so we've talked about availability, about discoverability, about analytics, and about revenue. And it sounds like all I'm doing is saying that YouTube is just vastly superior to Twitch in all of these different ways. But that's not necessarily true. There are still some things that Twitch does better than YouTube, especially when it comes to live streaming, that I want to make mention of. Because in all fairness, I said earlier in the video that Twitch was doomed, but it's really not. It just needs to evolve, especially in the face of a platform like YouTube starting to invade their industry. The biggest pluses that Twitch has right now over YouTube is the culture of the community. They have so many inside jokes and the use of emotes and just the interface in general for chatting and engaging is just so much more vibrant and exciting. And the fandom there really has a long history that doesn't exist on YouTube yet. But maybe big influencers like Tim the Tatman migrating from Twitch to YouTube, they might bring that kind of culture with them. And then the experience will start to look a lot more like Twitch and the uniqueness of that culture might not be as prominent. Moderation tools on Twitch, I think are still pretty superior to YouTube chat moderation tools for now. And that's probably also going to improve too. But Twitch is currently under fire for a lot of problems with streamers being able to control what's happening in their chat. So this may also cause some people to be more at ease about migrating from Twitch to YouTube. If Twitch doesn't do a good enough job addressing some of the major issues with those tools, then people are gonna get fed up. Another plus that Twitch has is it's relatively easy to get live on your channel. Whereas YouTube's live studio experience has been a little clunky, especially in the beginning. And although they're making improvements, I don't think it's quite there yet. So in my dashboard, I'll click create and I'll click go live. Then I'll say, I wanna go live right now. I'll use streaming software like OBS. And then I have to set up a few options. I gotta grab my stream key and the stream URL, put that in OBS. I have to choose latency options, whether or not to add delay, whether or not I want the video to actually appear as watchable content after I've gone offline. I actually kind of like this because it'll make for better content to actually not have that VOD out there with sort of the rough experience of a live broadcast, but instead be able to pull that out, edit it, 
and then turn it into a tighter piece of content that you can then re-upload. And if somebody wants to watch what they missed because maybe they missed your live stream, well, it'll be a more curated piece of content and um, a better experience. Rather than just watching a VOD on Twitch that's completely unedited and um, may make you feel like you actually missed out. And if that's too big a bummer, then you just don't watch it. You can click into an analytics tab and it looks like it actually gives you sort of live feedback as you stream. Viewer activity will show super chats or members and stream health. Wait a minute. I'm actually starting to think that they've really done a much better job here and made this a lot easier than it used to be. See, here I was trying to make a point that YouTube is not ready for live streaming, but it actually kind of looks like it's not that bad. All right, now here's probably the most important bow to tie on this whole video. Twitch is not bad. YouTube is not bad, right? They have their pros and their cons and they're growing in different ways and they have their different uses in most cases. And so this video is not trying to just make the case outright that you should leave Twitch for YouTube if Twitch is the platform that you're currently doing everything in, but I will make the argument that you can't dismiss what's happening on YouTube right now if you're going to be savvy as a content creator and consider yourself uh, a self-employed content creating business person influencing like whatever we want to call it at this point, um, non-boomer terms hopefully. The fact is you need to think about yourself as a business owner and if you're going to do that then you have to understand the value of diversifying at the very least, right? If you only do everything on Twitch, then it's like monoculture. What happened to monoculture? The potato famine. A lot of people died. It's bad. So if you're already on Twitch, uh, hey, stay on Twitch. But then maybe figure out a workflow where you can also fold in YouTube as another way for your viewers to stay engaged when you're offline. And with all the various analytics, revenue streams, and additional discoverability that you get on YouTube, uh, not only does that just kind of like open up more opportunity for you to be supported by your communities, but also there's some crossover that can now happen. People that discovered you on YouTube first can learn in your videos and descriptions that you also have a Twitch channel that they can go and follow and vice versa as well. You can remind your people on Twitch that, hey, you just started a YouTube channel and make sure you go check it out. It's a good way for them to stay engaged and then they go over there. And now we've got this beautiful cross pollination happening. But also I think I've made enough points in this video that if you decide to just outright leave Twitch for YouTube, um, that's probably not a bad idea right now. YouTube has enough going for it that I think it's probably a safe bet to make that move or to start your journey as a content creator on YouTube first. And that was not an argument I would make not that long ago. Well, there you go. End of long video rant about all this stuff. But the fact is, I think it was really important to point these things out. And um, yeah, so do me a favor. If you felt like you learned a lot in this video or it helped you develop your perspective on where to go next, um, click the like so that I know that it was a decent uh, video and that maybe you want more videos like this where I dive in a little bit more to the business of content creation uh, as well as the usual tech stuff that I show off from time to time. So, okay, there you have it. I appreciate it. Please go in the comment section and tell me what you did and didn't agree with here. Um, and I'll see you around. Welcome, and thanks for calling the RN Hawaii YouTube hotline. In a few words, tell us what you're calling about. You can say things like, my stream won't start, or how did you do that thing with your webcam? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Press zero to reach an operator who can assist you.